what liberation looks like. Liberation is not something that we can use our strategies to mimic. However, as we look with our hearts, we begin to see liberation emerge. And it looks like being surrendered to the situation right now, just as it is. When we let go of our demands on the present moment, the house of cards built by the ego begins to collapse and peace arises. And this feeling of the house of cards collapsing is actually a feeling where we can feel the energy drop into the center of our being. As we stop resisting, we fall onto the ground of our being, always at our center, but somehow missed in struggling. This center of our being, this peacefulness, the all that is, is right at the center, and it's the closest thing in life to us. And yet, somehow, we manage to avoid seeing it through the course of most days. To be calm, alert, and at peace. Calmness and peacefulness aren't states of dullness and lethargy, but highly alive, extremely clear. Attention moves briskly, yet effortlessly, to where it's drawn. If action is called for, movement flows without resistance to where it's needed. To experience life directly, free of interpretation or filters. All forms, sights, sounds, touch, taste, smells, emotions, thoughts, or any forms that our minds can recognize in whatever way are the products of our personal, particular narrow interpretation. As direct awareness of the deep self arises, form remains spontaneously, but though it's there, it's not believed in. We see it, but we know that there is a deeper reality that we're experiencing directly. To see what is as clearly as possible without misperception, denial, blind spots, etc. Misperception is always accompanied by a sense that something is wrong or threatening. And in fact, the sense that something is wrong or threatening causes us to choke, and that's generally the cause of a lot of the misperception. Allowing situations that the ego might judge as bad allows appropriate responses. No problem is improved by not seeing that it's there. To be aware of what the moment requires, sometimes called the next obvious thing. J. Krishnamurti called this action without thought. The imaginary self doesn't figure out what to do. Action is called from the essence of what we are by what the situation requires. Resting in mental clarity allows what is appropriate to emerge. To be free of judgment of others, of events, or of ourselves. Judgment of anything instantly creates an imaginary self through projection, self-blame, or seeing separation as real. There is someone who is making that judgment. The imaginary self is a familiar multimedia character identified with the particular contents of each moment. Another name for it is the ego. Sometimes called the imaginary self, our ego is a, the hypnotic sense of who we are based on the mental conditioning of how we remember our life's experiences. The ego sees itself as separate from the rest of life and fights to preserve its separation, remembering, always remembering, what threatens it. The ego is exceedingly clever in a subconscious kind of a way. It knows that it's ultimately an illusion, and it works to keep us focused on our problems, looking outside and not looking within to the stillness. The ego is composed of snapshots of the past. Research has shown that these memories 
are never very accurate. When a snapshot of the past is remembered and believed to be real now, an imaginary character who lived that memory is conjured up and seen as being the same as who I am now. To be free of manipulation from others that plays on our filters. Our filters are rooted in fears embedded in who we think we are. Our prejudices needs to be seen in certain ways, to be part of a group, ideas about future painful or desired experiences, all skew our experience of reality. People who are attached to the roles we play for them will ignore our sacred space and use what they know about our filters to try to control us. Just ask anyone who's ever been in a codependent relationship. Sacred space. Our highest good is always to allow and support the highest good of others. Observing their sacred space lets us expand into our own. Our sacred space is only known to us. It's subjective, but we can sense when we are beginning to come into someone else's sacred space. If we are truly with them, we can feel that we're invading and we can act accordingly. We subconsciously feel attacks we make on others as attacks on ourselves. Our subconscious mind can't distinguish between an attack on someone else and an attack on ourselves. Other sacred space includes their freedom to make mistakes as long as no one is hurt. The only person whose evolution and growth we're responsible for is us. To be able to relax into anything that is physically or emotionally painful. The saying goes, pain can be an unavoidable part of life, but suffering is optional. Resistance, physical or emotional, always um, adds another layer of difficulty to any experience and makes intuitive clarity about how to move with the situation harder to access. There is the situation of being broken down and having to repair your tire, and then there's a situation of being broken down and having to repair your tire and thinking that it is wrong, which is more difficult. Our natural state is self-authenticating. How do we know that anything is true? An unquestionable al aliveness arises as the false assumptions and fear that support the ego are directly revealed and so released. When it's no longer resisted and suppressed, this simple alive awareness is recognized, obvious, and beyond question. When life is experienced directly, it's like we've come home. As T.S. Eliot wrote, we arrive at where we started and we know the place for the first time. The ego invariably tries to hold on to this liberated experience, but it just simply cannot do that. But every strategy is eventually released. Adi Ashanti's fond of saying, every ego has its dance to do, it just has to dance it all the way out. <laughs>